First, I will be covering the pathogenesis of SARS-CoV-2. How does this virus cause disease? Before I review the pathogenesis, I wanted to begin with a case that illustrates the human consequences of this at times frightening infection. A middle-aged internal medicine physician was performing consults for the psychiatric service where he was exposed to several patients whose RT-PCR tests were found to be positive for SARS-CoV-2. Three days later, he developed a dry, non-productive hacking cough, fever, chills, and noticed a decreased sense of smell and taste. These symptoms were rapidly followed by increasing shortness of breath. On arrival to the emergency room, his oxygen saturation was 85%, normal being over 94%. His chest CT scan showed infiltrates or pacifications in both lungs, designated by the arrows, indicating bilateral pneumonia. He was immediately placed on nasal oxygen, increasing his oxygen saturations to 95%, and he was given intravenous fluids and the antiviral agent remdesivir. Over the next three days, he required higher and higher levels of oxygen. After being placed on an oxygen rebreather mask, delivering 100% oxygen, he continued to have a very high respiratory rate of 35 to 40 per minute. He reported feeling like he was about to drown. Because his oxygen levels could not be maintained, he was intubated. A breathing tube was inserted into his trachea, and he was placed on a mechanical ventilator. He became hypotensive, blood pressure dropping to 75 over 40, and he required vasopressors, agents that contract the blood vessels to increase his blood pressure. After 10 days on the ventilator, his oxygen levels improved, and he was taken off the ventilator. He had come very close to dying. His wife and three children, as well as the physicians and nurses caring for him, had followed his downward clinical course with horror. They were greatly relieved that he had survived, and they realized that many patients hospitalized with COVID-19 have not been so lucky. As exemplified by this case, caregivers need to protect themselves when working in the hospital, and protective measures will be covered in detail in Part 3 of this course. Now let's focus on the virus that caused this nearly tragic outcome. SARS-CoV-2 is part of a large family of RNA coronaviruses that infect many animal species, including bats. There are seven members that cause human disease. The first four cause a mild illness typical of a common cold. However, the other three family members can cause lethal respiratory infections. The newest member of this family is SARS-CoV-2, which got its name because its RNA sequence is more closely linked to SARS than to MERS. The name COVID-19 refers to the illness caused by SARS-CoV-2. This name does not include a geographic reference to reduce the likelihood of racism and blame. SARS-CoV-2 is 96% identical at the whole genome level to a bat coronavirus isolated called RATG13. The ability of this virus to infect humans is most likely the result of the bat coronavirus continuing to mutate. RNA replication and proofreading is particularly poor in the bat host. One or more chance mutations has rendered the SARS-CoV-2 capable of infecting humans. The bat virus first infected another intermediate mammalian host, possibly the pangolin, shown in the lower animal image. This animal was sold in Huanan, China, live animal fish market, where the virus was spread to humans. A second possibility is that the onset of the pandemic was the consequence of a laboratory leak from the Wuhan Institute of Virology a laboratory that studies bat coronaviruses. As time passes, the likelihood of determining the exact origin of the infection diminishes. Like all coronaviruses, the SARS-CoV-2 virus has prominent surface knobs made up of S protein or spike protein. They give the virus the appearance of a crown explaining the name corona. These knobs or spikes 
bind to the human respiratory epithelial receptor ACE2. As compared to SARS and MERS, SARS-CoV-2 knobs bind more tightly to this receptor, and this may explain its higher infection rate and why it so effectively infects the upper airways. Upon binding to the ACE2 receptor, the virus enters the cell cytoplasm within 10 minutes of binding. Viral RNA is quickly replicated using a viral-specific replicase. Proofreading is poor, explaining the virus's high frequency of mutations. The replicated RNA strands are assembled in the cytoplasm as nuclear capsids. At the same time, positive viral RNA strands encode for the synthesis of viral proteins that are transcribed and assembled in the endoplasmic reticulum, ER. The nuclear capsids suddenly bind to the outer surface of the ER where the knob protein and other sur pro surface proteins are added, and the virus is enclosed in a vesicle that subsequently rele is released into the extracellular fluid where it can, be, can infect adjacent cells as well as infect new hosts. The entire process takes approximately 10 hours explaining the rapid early replication of the virus after exposure. Human respiratory lining cells can be thought of as viral factories, and each cell is estimated to produce approximately 100 viral particles. Because the viral replicase has poor proofreading function, it frequently makes errors or point mutations in the RNA code. And because the virus has been able to infect large numbers of people, the probability for selecting a, quote, gain of function, unquote, mutation has been high. By gain of function, we mean changes in the amino acids that improve the ability of the virus to enter cells and to replicate. As of January 1st, 2022, there are five variants of interest. This table summarizes the five variants. The first was the alpha variant identified in the United Kingdom. This variant has 10 mutations in the spike protein, the two most important being a change of position 501 and asparagine for a tyrosine that increase the spike protein's binding affinity for the ACE2 receptor. That is, it caused tighter binding. And secondly, a position 681, a proline to a histidine at the furin cleavage site is thought to enhance cleavage and speed entry into cells. These mutations enhance the alpha variant's ability to spread from person to person, and it is 50 to 70% more contagious than the original wild type. This is measured as a higher reproductive rate, a measurement that will be discussed in the first epidemiology video. The alpha variant quickly became the dominant strain in the United Kingdom and the United States during the winter of 2020 and the spring of 2021. The second, the beta mutant, was first identified in South Africa. It has the same 501 mutation, increasing affinity for the ACE2 receptor, and a change at 484, thought to alter the conformation of the protein and increase its resistance to vaccines. More about this in module three. Third, is the gamma variant, first identified in Brazil and previously called the P1 mutant. It has multiple mutations in the spike protein, including the 501 mutation that increases ACE2 receptor binding and the 484E to K or EEC mutation. Both the beta and gamma variants have not reached high levels in other countries. However, the fourth variant, the delta variant, first identified in India, has key mutations at 478 that increases ACE2 receptor binding and 681 that enhances furin cleavage. And this variant has taken over as the dominant strain in many countries. It is 60% more contagious than the alpha mutant and quickly became the dominant strain in India, the United States, and the United Kingdom. The Delta variant can enter cells at 10 times the rate of the original variant and is capable of reproducing at much higher rates estimated to reach viral concentrations of 100 to 1,000 times higher than the original virus. Therefore, those who are infected 
with the Delta variant are capable of spreading the virus much more efficiently, as will be discussed in the updated epidemiology video. Finally, the Omicron variant, which was first reported in late November in South Africa. This variant has proven to be a game changer. Instead of 12, 10 to 12 mutations, it has 50, 36 of which are on the spike protein. This image from the NIH Vaccine Center shows the three-dimensional structure of the Omicron spike protein, and each small red ball represents an amino acid mutation. Note the large number of red balls. This figure from the Washington Post article by Bonnie Berkowitz and Aaron Steckerberg compares the mutations of the previous four variants with Omicron at the bottom. Rather than two to three mutations in the ACE2 binding site, Omicron has 15 and binds even more tightly to the ACE2 receptor than Delta. It also has more mutations in the furin cleavage site than previous variants. As a consequence of these mutations, it is capable of entering cells more efficiently. And as compared to the original virus that generated 100 virions per cell, Omicron can reproduce 7,000 per cell. The replication rate makes this variant even more contagious than the Delta variant. But more of this in Epidemiology 1 video. Since the appearance of the first Omicron variant, multiple new variants have been derived from the original BA1, including BA2 and BA5. And variants have subsequently arisen from these variants. BQ1.1 originating from BA5 and XBB1.5 originating from BA2, as shown in this ancestral diagram by Wang et al. published in Cell. These new variants are able to evade vaccine immunity and none of the commercial monoclonal antibodies are effective against these variants. Because of their variability to evade current immunity, these variants are beginning to dominate in many countries, including the United States. The virus initially replicates in the nasal passages and oral pharynx during the first 24 to 48 hours of infection. During this period, the patient is asymptomatic. However, particularly for the Delta and Omicron variants, the individuals can harbor billions to trillions of viral particles in their nasal passages and in saliva. As the virus migrates to the bronchi and then into the alveoli, it induces inflammation and symptomatic disease. The inflammatory response to the virus causes breakdown of the alveolar walls and leakage of serum into the alveoli, acutely blocking the exchange of oxygen in the lungs. Over time, with continued inflammation, the alveoli walls become fibrotic or scarred, a condition that chronically interferes with oxygen exchange. Multiple animal and tissue culture studies reveal that the Omicron variant replicates well in upper airway epithelial cells, but replicates poorly in cells derived from the lung. This difference has likely explained the lower incidence of pneumonia and the reduced need for oxygen administration in cases infected with this variant. But more about this in the video on clinical characteristics. To summarize this video, SARS-CoV-2 is a bat-related RNA virus that grows and replicates in the cytoplasm of cells. The virus contains the surface S protein that forms knobs, and these knobs bind to human ACE2 receptors with high affinity. Once it is internalized, the virus actively replicates in airway epithelial cells and spreads, spreads from the upper airway to the bronchi and then to the alveoli. Infection in the alveoli causes fluid leakage followed by fibrosis, and both conditions cause hypoxia. Because of the poor viral RNA replication accuracy, multiple gain-of-function mutants or variants have arisen. Of particular concern were the alpha variant originating in the United Kingdom, the delta variant spreading from India to the United Kingdom and the United States, and most recently, Omicron variant that originated in South Africa and has quickly spread to all of Europe and the United States. The Alpha, Delta, and Omicron variants are able to spread from person to person with progressively higher efficiency as compared to the original viral strain.